Hello and welcome to the Harper's Podcast. My name is Violet Luca, and I'm Harper's web editor. This is the first in a new weekly podcast that will feature discussions of articles and current events by Harper's contributors and other experts, as well as our monthly live talks. In this episode, Kevin Baker, I'm a writer and a longtime resident of New York City. And Jeremiah Moss. I'm the blogger at Vanishing New York and author of the book Vanishing New York, How a Great City Lost Its Soul, which is coming out in paperback in July. Talk through the issues raised in our July cover story titled The Death of a Great City. In it, Baker writes, quote, New York Today in the aggregate, is probably a wealthier, healthier, cleaner, safer, less corrupt, and better run city than it ever has been. The same can be said for most of those other cities seen as recent urban success stories, from Los Angeles to Philadelphia, Atlanta to Portland, Oregon. But we don't live in the aggregate. For all of New York's shiny new skin and shiny new numbers, what's most amazing is how little of its social dysfunction the city has managed to eliminate over the past four decades, end quote. Here's the conversation. Please note that there's a little bit of New York that comes through in this. You can hear a siren in the background at some point. And there's a slight crackle in Jeremiah's microphone. However, it, both of those problems are quickly resolved and uh, should only contribute to the gritty authenticity of this conversation. Enjoy. Thank you both for coming today. So... There's this saying that a lot of New Yorkers use that, you know, the nature of cities is that they change. But there's something very different about the changes that have taken place over the past 20 years, possibly longer, that distinguish this era from times in New York history where someone like Robert Moses was pulling the strings very heavily or, you know, the Gilded Age where these Robert Barons would sort of set up shop in these giant Fifth Avenue mansions. So I guess what today, um, even though it would be fun to sort of talk about great places that have gone away, uh, we're going to focus on how this change is different, how this happened. Um, and I guess it would be great to start with the lack of transparency about how development projects happen nowadays, because it's a multi-layered process that I don't think everyone, even a lot of New Yorkers, are really aware of. I would say they've got it almost down to an art now. Uh, the great example was the uh, Atlantic Yards development in Brooklyn, mm. uh, which in an amazing sleight of hand, uh, they were able to evict, I think, hundreds of people, hundreds of uh, dozens of businesses in the area, build this completely unneeded, rather tatty looking um, <laughs> arena for a bad basketball team owned by a Russian oligarch. Yeah. And did it without forcing any elected politician to take a vote on it, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's really an amazing. You know, Boss Tweed would be would be proud. Uh, that's an amazing exercise in uh, in corruption without it seeming at all like corruption. Without with it going completely by the book. You know, there was a shift when we talk about like the the change and when the change happened into this sort of hyper development city that we have that was really you know at the mid to late 1970s this this neoliberal shift the shift to moving welfare from the poor to the rich so you talk about you know Atlantic Yards was a really big one and they got hundreds of millions of dollars in tax incentives if not more and Hudson Yards is a huge one and that was Michael Bloomberg's baby yeah. and the developers there again got hundreds of millions of dollars from the city to build that. I think um, it was estimated that it was going to cost the city $950 million. Right. And, you know, that's going to the uber-rich. It's going to be a curated city within a city. That's that's a great point you make, uh, Jeremiah, about the welfare incentives. Uh, you know, another thing with Atlantic Yards, uh, that was the air rights to it were owned by the MTA, and the uh, uh, Bruce Ratner, the developer who uh, ended up acquiring the space, uh, did not put in the high bid. Uh, perhaps a hundred million, perhaps two hundred million dollars were left on the table. 
In other words, we're all paying higher subway fares so that this Russian oligarch can have his basketball team there. It's amazing. And and Bloomberg said, you know, wouldn't it be a godsend if all the Russian oligarchs would move to yes. New York? Yes, yeah, I know. I know. It's. I guess it's a natural human tendency to want to live with your own, which is why right. Bloomberg wanted to fill up the, the city with billionaires. But, you know, the, one of the things, too, these aren't even your grandfather's billionaires. Mm -hmm. You know, the... I, I'm no apologist for the old robber barons, but they at least lived in New York. They built spectacular buildings for themselves and for and for others. They employed boatloads of people, and they were generally here, at least buying things. One of the really pernicious parts of the new New York is that so many of these super wealthy coming in here, these super rich, are the worst people from all around the world, and they are generally in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. They're here maybe two weeks a year, so they're not contributing anything to the economy, and they've taken enormous amounts of space off the market. That uh, you know, it's like the idea of the old king's preserve, where you said, you know, this is my forest, and I'll hunt when I come here, and you're not allowed to hunt even when I'm not here. Um, this is the kind of undemocratic nature of what New York is now. Yeah, there's like this very odd shift, and I think we'll touch on some of the things that are part of this, almost towards a type of feudalism, where it is yes. sort of like, okay, so you align yourself with this feudal lord or this um, Silicon Valley developer, right, and right. you get benefits from him, and it's always a him, and yes. you you know, you know get fed by him, you know, he provides you with uh, lodgings yeah. and what have you, and everything of your lifestyle is subsidized, and it seems like, the 40 hour work week, which is within the history of humanity, a relatively new thing, yeah. very short, yeah. <laughs> could go away very quickly if things like this are not addressed and people don't sort of start taking action against it. But I do want to step back and sort of talk about what is this shift? Why are people okay with it to not really mm. seeing what this is at the moment? Well, I think going, going back to to neoliberalism, right? So, which mm. I know is a difficult word. It's a difficult word for Americans <laughs> in particular because of that word liberal. Sounds and, communist. <laughs> right? um, and as Noam Chomsky says, it's neither new nor liberal. And, you know, basically it's radical free market capitalism. It's Reaganomics, trickle down economics, all that stuff. And it's marked by deregulation, privatization, and this movement, this redistribution of wealth upwards from the poor to the very rich. Uh, and it's why we have the 1% with this vast inequality, right? But it also really works in a very stealthy way psychologically. I'm also a psychoanalyst, so I'm interested in that, in that mm -hmm. part of it. I see this using memes, and these memes get into people's heads. Some of these memes are things like, it's always been this way. Right. Uh, I would put New York is always changing as one of those memes. People are always telling me New York is always changing. It's repeated and repeated. So I think it falls into the category of meme. And it's true, mm. right? But it's also used to discredit and distract. And these memes really convince people that there's nothing we can do and that this is normal. We're in fake news territory. This is not normal. This is not natural. And we can do something about it. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And I think one of the attractions of this, of the new city, was the kind of shiny gloss that was put on it. Mm -hmm. mm. And I, I start my article by, you know, trying to push back the whole general criticism of, oh, you're just nostalgic for when you were young and new in the city. And sure, I am. But I'm pretty clear-eyed about what the 70s were like. I, I moved to New York in 1976. And I, I don't miss things like stepping out of my stoop and seeing a bunch of uh, crack vials there. I don't miss, uh, you know, a lot of the dirt. I don't miss... Human um, misery. Uh, human misery. <laughs> all the Bronx burning, all the yep. bad things that were going on. Um, and, it, you know, so it looks superficially, you walk down the street and things like, hey, this is this is better. But if you probe an inch deep, it's really not. And that was one of the things I was most surprised at was how most of the major social dysfunctions in the city have actually not improved, only gotten slightly worse. Homelessness is at record levels. Yes. There's something like close to four people a day overdosing. Uh, you know, the, the city's advertising, uh, what is it, Naxalone? Yeah. And all these places saying, you know, hey, be, be ready to give your, you know, the person next to you on the bus a quick shot to the heart if they fall over. And the poverty level is still above what it was even when the city uh, was supposedly on the edge of bankruptcy in 1975. 
So this is, you know, this is not really improved except for the wealthiest among us. I think also part of this or these memes that we're talking about, a huge one is, well, the Democrats always win, you know, right. the, the, on the state level, at every level. Yes, it's like yeah. we're protected because it's blue. Yes. And there's this very false idea of what their interests are, what they will actually do. So can we talk a bit about Bill de Blasio's election and term and, uh, I don't know, maybe give a sh quick shout out to poor old um, Anthony Weiner, who probably would have done the same thing, but we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was really fooled by Bill de Blasio, I have to say. He had this beautiful progressive rhetoric coming into the election, and I really don't think that he is a progressive. In terms of neoliberalism, I mean, Democrats are neoliberals too, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's where, again, a lot of people don't understand that part of it, and that it's still a pro-business position, uh, it's a pro-growth position, and that is that is going to contribute to this vast inequality that we have. And inequality, you know, as, as you're pointing out, Kevin, you know, inequality places that are most unequal have the highest levels of social dysfunction, mental illness, sickness, physical illness. Uh, it's not healthy for people. I, I think the Democrats do have a lot to answer for. I think De Blasio has been a big disappointment, although my expectations for him were were pretty measured. But, you know, the, part of the problem of this, and, and, and also also the Democrat up in the governor's mansion has a lot to answer for. Oh, absolutely. Um, but part of the problem, part of the reason why New York City is such a one-party town is because even local Republicans have bought into the extreme radical ideological party that, um, th that the National Republican Party has become. You used to have really creative, useful reformers who were Republicans in New York City and state? Fiorello LaGuardia was a uh, was a Republican originally. John Lindsay, Nelson Rockefeller. You had people who were dealing with the real world and making at least some attempt to clean up government and deliver services to people. Uh, the person running against uh, De Blasio was this assemblywoman from from Staten Island, who talked. It seemed to me almost exclusively about property taxes and how they had to be lowered. You know, just kind of not really involved in what was what was really going on here. And of course, the rent is too damn high guy was just <laughs> laughed out of town, even though it's like, yes, everyone agrees. I, I actually, <laughs> everyone... in, in one, one year with particularly horrible choice for mayor, I actually voted for the rent is too damn high Good. party. Good. <laughs> in protest. <laughs> yeah. You know, you touched on the governor. Do you feel like part of this is because of the New York City New York State divide because the MTA is controlled mm -hmm. by state funds and a lot of times the explanation given for not improving things is like oh well we don't want to give that much money to this sort of thing even though it's it's how you know this is the lifeblood of this city like people can't and it contributes to so many other problems that you know we'll talk about certainly oh yeah and, and it's not just uh, the city and the trains have been terribly neglected uh, also, out on Long Island, people yeah. are running around with their hair on fire over how badly the LIRR runs. Uh, the governor, at, it, it, with the port is uh, with his partial control of the port authority, allowed Chris Christie to take money that should have been used for badly needed new tunnels under the Hudson River, and use spend them to you know keep himself afloat in New Jersey instead. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. I think it has to do with maybe. Cuomo's um, national aspirations. He wants to be seen as not raising taxes. I mean, he's not necessarily wrong in saying that New York and downstate should pay to help a lot of upstate, that we are the, the richest part of the, of the state by far. Mm -hmm. But it just seems that whatever tax revenue we produce goes into a great big pit somewhere around Buffalo that his developer friends have uh, dug. So, you know, nothing seems to improve, but he seems to somehow think it'll make him president. Mm. We can only hope. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Because <laughs> like, look, look how well that worked for Rudy Giuliani, right? <laughs> exactly. I like Cynthia Nixon. Oh, me too. Oh, yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah, no, and it is exciting to see. I mean, this is an interesting moment because we do, there are so many um, legitimate challengers from a much further left field coming up now because I think people are sort of like you know with the 2016 election you know the um sort of like 
saying, okay, someone can just call themselves a democratic socialist and uh, people will vote for them and people will get excited for that person. Like there is, we people are getting squeezed in every possible way and now there is an excitement for and a real impetus for change, but it's just a matter of harnessing that. Because again, it's like, you know, people say, oh, Cynthia Nixon is unqualified, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, well, look at what people who are qualified have yeah, gotten e- exactly. us. <laughs> I mean, it's exactly. Like you I, understand I, that I, position. <laughs> exactly. I, I normally would be against voting for somebody for governor who had no previous uh, experience in government, but it's sort of at this point, you know, there's a thing Casey Stangle used to say when he made certain moves and he'd question him and he'd say like, well, what do you want me to do? Stand around and lose? And, uh, you know, this is the thing. We're just we're just getting so crunched now yeah. that we can't uh, put up with more uh, more of this kind of Cuomo de Blasio neoliberalism. Yeah. Do we want to talk a little bit about how these developments take place and how that is sort of a part of the Democratic Party machine? The interaction between BIDs, uh, the business in development groups, the the neighborhood, this illusion of neighborhood control and the community board, um, which I looked up a few people on my community board, which is a weird gerrymandered, mysteriously gerrymandered <laughs> only on the North Brooklyn waterfront <laughs> yeah. from Greenpoint to Dumbo. It's very odd why they chose to do that, but whatever. I'm sure they had the best intentions. Uh, one of the people on my community board uh, works for Landmine Realty, which is just like... <laughs> It's <laughs> such a perfect, like, okay, I get what you're going for here. But there is sort of this illusion of participatory democracy that is just being completely abused at the moment. So BID stands for Business Improvement District. And these groups are organizations of business people in the neighborhood. They have boards, and largely at this point, they're made up of real estate developers, really big, powerful real estate developers. They are also largely in affluent white parts of town. And what they do is they manage, quote unquote, public spaces. So they are another uh, neoliberal construct that came about in the 70s when the city didn't have the funds to manage public spaces. And they turned it over to these private groups. So they're, they're undemocratic and they have a lot of power. And one of the things they're able to do is they're able to raise uh, commercial rents in the area. They raise property values. And they also are able to influence what types of businesses go in there. So they bring in a lot of chain stores. And Mm -hmm. and that's part of why we see so many of the the chain stores that we do, like around Union Square. There's a BID that manages Astor Place. And Astor Place has changed wildly. It is now this sort of corporate. It's this wild kind of, you know, it's not even a park. It's a public space. It's just an open area. And... What the uh, Village Alliance BID does now is they bring in these corporate marketing events, right? So one thing BIDs can do is they have their own private security forces. So they police these areas and they decide basically who can be there and who can't, essentially. Uh, There's no velvet, there's sort of an invisible velvet rope. But when they have these corporate events, there are actual velvet ropes. There are actual (laughs) ropes around it and you have to go into an entrance. And people go in and they interact. So they'll interact with, say, it's an IBM event. And they'll interact with, oh, IBM's put these things out and these screens. We're going to take selfies. We're going to Instagram them. And people are participating and people are agreeing to do the marketing for these corporations. And, and, you know, That's and a great point. Yeah, and, you know, and again, people aren't thinking about it, and people aren't resisting that, you know, in that immediate moment. Um, so that's, you know, again, B, you know, BIDs are these these public private partnerships that are that are vastly undemocratic, and the urbanist Sharon Zukin has called them an oligarchy. And Esther Place, I think, is a great example, Jeremiah, in that um, it has such a history. I mean, this is the thing back in the eighteen fifties you had this uh, kind of ludicrous but terrible riot there that started as a, between, as a feud between two actors and devolved into this riot where dozens of people were killed by the local by, by the militia having to shoot them down in the street. And this kind of horrified New Yorkers. And they really felt this showed this huge divide between the rich and the working class in the city. And something had to be done about it. 
And one of, it gave great impetus to building a huge park where everyone could commune together, which became Central Park. And it led to them really rebuilding a lot of the square to bring in this relatively cheap, middle-class, working-class housing. So this square that was originally intended to bring together uh, all New Yorkers is now a prime example of their separation, you know, by these, it's the, the positive, just physically, it's been wrecked by things like the Death Star, this enormous new <laughs> glass building that literally just cuts off views from happening. It's really no longer uh, the, the plaza that it was. Uh, and this goes on all over the city. Um, and there's a great, you know, and the, and the BIDs are part, and the BIDs are in cities all over uh, the country now. Um, Scott Walker in Wisconsin has brought them to small towns in Wisconsin <laughs> as well, uh, always ahead of his time. But there was a great quote at the time, you know, they got sued. Uh, the one in Grand Central got sued for basically organizing homeless people into goon squads to kind of attack other uh, homeless people. And they were underpaying people and everything. And they finally got brought to court. And uh, actually, it was Judge uh, Sonia Sotomayor who ruled against the BID and made forced them to make some kind of restitution. And there was a great quote from uh, this guy, Tommy Washington, who was then a 41-year-old uh, BID worker and a plaintiff in the suit there. And when this all came down, he said, you know, you donate lampposts, flower beds, Bryant Park. How are you going to represent Beautify if you're doing ugly behind that? And I think that's that sums it up pretty well. It's fascinating to note that there's an international component with, you know, people like the owner of the Brooklyn Mets. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you ever want to see a game there, I'm sure you can get tickets that are really great. <laughs> it's usually <laughs> empty. It's usually yeah, very for, empty. For a, for, a, for a fortune, even though it's empty. And that's a, but but yes. to, to your other question about the democratic machine, you know, this is sort of the weird thing. It's not even a machine the way machines used to be. Machines used to be kind of transactional. And I'm not an apologist for them and they were awfully exploited but they gave new immigrants and working class people in new york certain services in exchange for their vote mm -hmm. and that direct exchange long ago broke down now these people are just kind of clubhouse hacks if you notice you know in the old days the machine brought democracy to the streets it was very involved in finding out who could work for it who would vote for it who the people were on this block you know they were constantly bringing you to the polls and bringing out reformers to fight them. Today, our elected legislators hide away for the most part. Good luck finding them, except like the week before the election. Many of them run unopposed. They're just quietly making these deals with developers, with, with realtors, and uh, imposing them on the rest of them. New York has too little democracy and too much democracy. You know, things like community boards are kind of too difficult to follow, like the way the old school boards were so corrupt, uh, you know. And they, and they have no power. I mean, yeah, they have no other, power. You know, yeah. And at the same time, there's, you know, there's very little democracy in yeah. other ways. You know, we're close to another corporation that seemingly operates in the public interest, which is NYU. Um, mm -hmm. When do you see that change of universities? Um, <laughs> Seemingly being the key word. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, th that change of universities, because this is something that has happened with Columbia, you outlined this article. This has happened with Cooper Union, which used to be tuition free. Mm -hmm. uh, this happens with NYU. Um, I'm sure that there are other colleges in Brooklyn getting, getting excited about the possibilities of what they could own. Can we talk about that shift? of the university as this is a seemingly nonprofit institution to like, we got to have a location in Abu Dhabi and right. Hong Kong. We right. got to yeah. globalize this uh, thing. Same, yeah. same thing. Neoliberals. I mean, at the, at the risk of banging that drum, I don't know if you can bang it no. too much, but <laughs> Never. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's such a huge, powerful monster. And, mm -hmm. and so people who are academics will complain about, you know, students are now consumers, right? I mean, this is this is this is another yeah, important part yeah, of neoliberalism much. is that it's the shift from people participating, people being part of the city, and in a way that they're actually participating in in, in government and how it's shaped to consumers, right? Mm -hmm. From citizens yes. to consumers, so so students are now consumers. And professors have to provide a product. So everything is about you're either a consumer or you are a product or you are a, you are a brand. And if you're a brand and if you're a product, are you 
an educational institution? You know, what is the priority? And the priority in neoliberalism is growth. It's always growing, growing, growing. It's the corporate model. So when you go to a corporate model, you know, you have to ask uh, in that growth machine, you know, what is getting lost? What is what is not being cared for? What is not being attended to? Yes. And again, this is a totally different uh, view of um, education in the post-war era where it's like, oh, you should go to college. <laughs> it can Absolutely. improve. You know, it, it right. can. It, and, and now it seems like it is a very much a transactional thing. And, and mm-hmm. recently there was um, a de Blasio, which might have been his most radical piece of legislation in recent years, proposed getting rid of this um I think blatant um, segregation oh, of yeah. of you know with mm-hmm. these tests that are supposed to show who is gifted and who is not in New York Public City Schools. I saw this video of like a 12, 13 year old boy who's just screeching into a microphone about how this is so unfair because he's taken all these courses with his private tutor and like you know it's like what did mm-hmm. I go through all that for? This is so unfair and it's like. Wow, <laughs> you're really right. wow. Well, yeah. If only you had learned something from yeah. <laughs> from, it, from anything. Like it was, it was kind of incredible. But there, right. there is this this the way in which education has changed and functions also greatly impacts what the city looks like, who gets to enjoy what, yeah. what is mm-hmm. even accessible. And it's it is sort of a forty and assembly line thing where it's just like okay, you go from this line to that line to this, and at the end you're complete and you get to make a, you know, uh, seven figure salary as a lawyer or what have you. And you get to buy your 4.0, you're expecting to get, yes. that's your product. Too, yes. right? I yeah. think, uh, Jeremiah had a great point about universities being sold as brands. Mm-hmm. You know, in recent years, we've taken a few young relatives uh, on a tour of Columbia. And it is simply amazing now. It's kind of sold as a club med. You know, you go into the cafeteria, mm-hmm. they have separate mm-hmm. stations or people are carving roast beef, making omelets. Uh, they actually told us at one point, you know, we have a relationship with Jacques Torres, the, the chocolatier. Oh my God. And sometimes he and his sous chefs like to come up here and in this one dorm they go and they, they make some chocolate treats for the kids. And, you know, I, I was wow. laughing, you know. It's just like, you know, when I, when I was there, the big fear was I'd be carried away by the cockroaches in the, yeah. you know, in the <laughs> night. Uh, it's amazing. They've, but it really is, they really are pernicious. They really are supposed to have some public function. Yeah. And, you know, mm-hmm. Columbia has a long history of trying to just kind of take over the surrounding neighborhood, which they've largely succeeded at. Uh, but NYU has, yeah, has torn down half the West Village. And Cooper Union most is saddest of all in a way. I mean, Peter Cooper was this wonderful self-made man uh, who became this great philanthropist. He set up the school specifically for working class people to go to after their working hours. Um, it became this great forum in American history. Lincoln spoke there. Clara Lemlich spoke there in the uprising of the 20,000 garment workers. You know, it really was this paradigm of what public education or cheap education could accomplish. And for whatever reason, I, I suspect it has something to do with, you know, nobody's content to simply bring in a great institution along for another 20 years. They have to leave their mark on it. Uh, but for whatever mm-hmm. reason, they've really just decided to ravage the area around them and have kind of almost gone broke in the doing of it. Uh, and now it's total confusion. Now they do charge tuition after, you know, 150 years. Uh, and this is, you know, this has been no good for anybody involved. It's simply empire building. Do you feel like a lot of this need to sort of define a brand or stake a claim that is physical also has to do with sort of this technological shift we've seen in society? Because I was thinking about this, just how I have a problem where I need to buy pet food, right? So I know the pet store near me closes at seven, but does my commute last long enough that I would get there before it closes? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Right. So it, the way in which the trains, which again, going a couple of miles can sometimes take longer than it takes to fly from New York to another city. <laughs> Yes. And it's like how does like and it's like this is supposed to be the most developed, advanced, you know, everything happens yeah. in New York. Yeah. And it, it's just unbelievable. I mean the, the, the train system is a miracle of engineering, right. but it has not in any way attempted to catch up in in, in any meaningful way, I should say. There have definitely been th- you know, initiatives like the little um 
what stop is next sign. Wow, thank you. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't care what time the train is coming. Oh, 50 minutes, thank you. You know, it's, it's, you're in the metro in Paris. They, they, you wonder why they even have the signs. Right. Because they say, like, next train, 30 seconds, you know, and then it's yeah. then 20 seconds, you know, and it's like, oh, okay. You know, that's been a terrible neglect of them. But that's the thing. Everything is, everything becomes more and more privatized. There's less and less incentive to put money into the great public things. Mm -hmm. You know, the subway, Kenneth Jackson said that without the subway, New York is Bridgeport. And that's, that's pretty true, but mm -hmm. it's being horribly neglected. And this leads to real problems for, for working class people, for middle class people, even for, even for executives, yeah. <laughs> perish the thought, well, trying to get someplace. It's considered public, right? Yeah. You're saying the privatization yeah. and anything that's labeled public in in a neoliberal society is considered uh, less than not worth you know not worth putting anything into, and and it's also associated with people of color, right? There's there's this way. Um, there's a writer, I think his name is Randolph Hole H O H L E who's written about this about how private um, got associated with whiteness and public got associated with blackness and then all of you know all of this racism that comes in comes into that which is really an important piece of the whole the, of the whole puzzle and 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 why new york is the way it is there's a lot of white supremacy underlying these shifts oh yeah and we can yeah. see that with the uh trump's voting Very lawyer much. yeah <laughs> and, yeah. It, and it's everyone is shocked and it's like well no Mm -hmm. Look around you. Like, right. look who is, look who are the workers, look who are being served. And it's this very clear divide. And I mean, I know a lot of this conversation about these sort of changes. Uh, you quote this amazing Rebecca Solnit piece where she talks about how gentrification is like the fin above the water. And then below <laughs> that, great. there is, um, this the truth in which you know we will all be poor a few of us will be far richer and everything will be faster more homogenous and more controlled or controllable like yes. that aspect of it is relegated to like you know we just need to get, stop sending white people to these places it's like well no that's part of the problem but it's not the whole problem well it, it's interesting how you can see in a small way day to day in new york how the increasing atomization of the society really hurts everybody yeah. i mean it used to be when we were, you know, running real late for something, you know, my wife and I would say, oh, hell, we'll just spend the money, take a cab. You know, the rich person's alternative, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, good luck. Usually, even as badly as the subway runs, if you're going any distance in New York now, uh, the traffic is so bad. It's so stuffed with private cars mm -hmm. that you won't get there first. Uh, so you need this thing, the subway. You see this every day. But still, there's this kind of ideological, almost theological aversion to putting enough money into it, right. to keeping the public sector alive. Because public, in addition to be being associated with black, is associated with, oh, that's corrupt. Yeah. Oh, how can we trust mm -hmm. it? It's you corrupt, it's, it's big bad, government. it's, it's big, tawdry, right. yes. you know, it's all the these Democrats. things. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, we do see the impact. But then also it's like, well, what are the options for these people driving these cars? What options do oh, they yeah. have? Because the whole thing with Uber when it started is like, Get rid of the middleman. Mm -hmm. Get rid of the taxi. That's too right, expensive. Right. <laughs> and now there are places that provide cars for people who are driving for Uber or Lyft or whatever. They provide insurance specifically for those cars that they drive. Well, okay, so you replace the middleman with yourself, and now you're just squeezing the life out of these people so they have to drive like 80 hours a week just to get by. This is a far worse situation. This is not a smart thing at all. Like you thought you outwitted it, but you've just made the world hell. <laughs> oh, and I, and I remember, I remember when Uber was first coming out, there was a big Thomas Friedman column about maybe this is the future. Oh, and we'd all set up restaurants in our apartments and we'd all have Uber, we'd all be Uber drivers and we'd all be doing these things. And it's ridiculous. You know, there, there, there are at least two different apartments in my building where people were trying to run uh, Airbnbs. Right. And, you know, it got so, one of them on the first floor and these families who lived would be going through almost literal clouds of pot smoke that would be coming out of this every day, you know? Um, and, and who knows who you've allowed into the building now? You know, this is, 
you know, I, I don't want to live in the middle of a club med, you know, a cheap club. I don't want to live in a youth hostel. Yeah, like what, 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 what <laughs> paradise is it where your home is also a hotel, your yeah. car is also a taxi, all this stuff. It's, 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 it's not a paradise at all. It's like you're just getting squeezed more and more. And again, it's under the auspice of, oh, this is progress. This is and, technology. Right, and they use yeah. that term, the sharing economy. And sharing yes, is such yeah. a Mr. Rogers <laughs> neighborhood's kind of, of term. Yes, 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 right? yes. Yeah. 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 No, it's it is horrible, and and you've totally abrogated your ties to everybody you live with in the yeah. world. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know. Well, and a lot of the new people. I mean, this is a complaint that that I've made that I hear a lot from my readers on on Facebook. A lot of the new people, whether they're young or or they're older, who are moving into. So I have I have new people who've moved into my my apartment building was sold to an LLC mm -hmm. behind an LLC yeah. behind yeah. an LLC. Too. <laughs> um, you know, it used to be run by a, a family that I knew and, um, they weren't great, but they yeah. were part of my life. Yeah. Um, and so now we have new people moving in because the, the LLC is opening up apartments. Um, the new people will not, they, they will not say hello. Of course. So this is a thing, right? So I, I say hello to them, and they look at the floor and ignore me and push on by. It's a very bizarre mm -hmm. behavior. And they also fill the hallway with boxes that are being shipped from Amazon and <laughs> right. other places, yeah. right? right. Yeah. And over the years, you know, all of us get something occasionally shipped to us. But the new people, the hallway is piles and piles of these boxes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I read about this in the book, but but... I do think that there's the tech stuff, but there's also a, a new mentality of people coming to New York because it is safer, because it is cleaner. Mm -hmm. People who are risk averse are coming to the city. Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. the people Good who point. used to come were people who liked risk or were willing to take risks. Yeah. And now when you have risk averse people, you have people who don't really like cities. They don't really know how to be mm -hmm. in cities. They don't mm -hmm. want to be around other people. They don't want to share space. Uh, they want to be in their own bubbles and and some of those bubbles are tech bubbles with the phone walking around that's a bubble they want to have this kind of private privatized yeah. Ex yeah. experience even as they're moving down the sidewalks and through the hallways of their apartment buildings yeah I think I think you put it at a good phrase about it, the vertical suburb yeah and this is sort of what these uh, what a lot of these people want I've, I've had more success with the new people in my building who I have generally been very nice and and uh, bringing more kids in, but the the trouble is too. I know they're there only in a on a temporary basis because they're being charged five thousand dollars for seven hundred square feet. Mm -hmm. So when the second kid or the third kid or whatever comes, or the company is who's subsidizing them from wherever mm -hmm. moves them on, they'll be gone. And that's that's the whole idea too, where everything is supposed to be in this kind of transient mode, whereby businesses don't last. Community relations don't ma don't last, so these LLCs can maximize their profits on apartments on anything. That's right. Yeah, these these folks are around for a year. You know, I've been in my building twenty five years, and I yeah. I'm one of the newest. But but the new people who've come after me, they're there a year and they just revolve mm -hmm. out. So you don't have that fabric. You don't have that checking in with each other that we do with our our, our other neighbors, and and it doesn't feel good. It feels really crummy. Yeah to be around that kind of mentality. Yeah. Um, and like you're saying, you know, Kevin, with the businesses, um, you know, we're supposed to be excited now about the new pop-up economy. Yeah. <laughs> and that this is no. what Bleecker Street is going to be. Oh, and Brookfield Properties, if you read this, Brookfield Properties is buying up all of these retail condos, which is kind of a new thing, on Bleecker Street. And they're going <laughs> to turn it into an outdoor curated mall that they control. Okay. <laughs> And they want to have pop-ups. And, and how exciting is, is it to have constant change? And the pop-ups will be there for a month, and then you'll have another thing. And that's wonderful and exciting. And the stability, and yes, the city's always changing, it has also had a stability to it on the streets and in the buildings. Yeah. And that stability is being ripped to shreds. Yeah. Well, I think you could always define New York as sort of the big city, little city. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the big, glamorous world capital where the movers and shakers come. It's been in New York for a long, long time. But there was always underneath that uh, and living alongside it, the little city, the city of a million neighborhoods that were fairly tight. And I think the city has generally worked best historically when both were doing well. And that's a hard balance 
to, to, to get. And there are things, certainly there were always things wrong with the little city too, such as racism. We don't want, you know, people of color here. We don't want whoever here. But I think the little city right now is being crushed. And that's not a good... I also think there are some people who come in here and really want the city experience and are very disappointed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, my neighborhood, I can't believe people really want to pay $4 million for a condo and find themselves in a neighborhood that doesn't have a good restaurant where a third of the store space is vacant. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, it's like living in Binghamton and you've paid New York prices. Right. I, I, don't, I don't think they particularly like this, but I think it's a very sad thing too that even these fairly well-off, well-connected people don't think there's any way to change the system. Mm -hmm. And I think that's increasingly how Americans live now. Yeah. They don't like it, but they don't know what to do. Right. What you're describing with purchasing this piece of property that has literally no perceivable benefit in terms of yeah. what you actually live really has to do with this notion of New York as an achievement yeah. and that it has prestige and is, it is this it says mm -hmm. something about you that you live here oh, and you yeah. are therefore imbued with the brand of New York. But again, it doesn't have anything to do with the day to day of like, OK, so it's nine o'clock and I want to get something from a bodega. Well, I can't because there are no <laughs> bodegas that have been <laughs> stamped out. I mean, and it also with the university's expansion stuff, too, where it's like, OK, so this is part of the value of us, you know, bringing in these things that are only for our students that we can sell to these students that, are, you know, it's part of this luxury experience. And you don't have to talk to your neighbor. You don't have to oh, yeah. interact with any silly brown people like it's very safe. And so yeah. much is done in the name of safety that it, mm -hmm. it, even though there is so much more human suffering. Oh, oh the, the pitches for these places are hilarious. For these, oh, I'm sure. That cuts in yards in a, in, a, in a really sick way. They're, they're hilarious. Always for like, you know, strivers and achievers and mm -hmm. geniuses. Innovators. You know, yeah, yes. it's innovators. Yeah. It's like yeah. that, you know, that Woody Allen quote in some movie. He had like, you know, a lot of geniuses. You know, you should meet some ordinary people. Every yes. Now and then. Yeah. yes. Yeah. We're all the, mm -hmm. the Ubermensch here, you mm -hmm. know, and we're just... Uh, you know, it makes it really unpalatable. Yeah. How do we turn the tide? If even the ultra wealthy feel powerless mm -hmm. against this, what are steps that can be taken, tangible steps that can be taken besides sort of helping bolster alternates like Cynthia Nixon, right, right. Uh, Ocasio, other, other people running? I think it's going to be very hard. I mean, I think it's, it's gotten to a point. We're so far down the track on this now that it'll be very difficult to turn it around. Um, you know, Michael Greenberg made some great suggestions in the New York Review of Books about how we should stop doing things like 421A, which was a good program maybe for the 70s, but really outdated now, mm -hmm. which is a way, you know, you, if you have X number of affordable apartments, and affordable can vary a lot, then you can build a luxury high-rise. That just guarantees more luxury housing in the future. So we can get rid of that and just build public housing good public housing. Um, I think we need to bring back the restriction on how much co-ops can, uh, can charge the stores. And, you know, this is not, it's not only the super wealthy who are afflicting us. We, we have met the enemy and they is us, you know. Uh, people in these condos and co-ops now, and the co-ops used to be restricted to getting 20% of the revenue for, for the building from rents from the ground floor stores. And that was list lifted uh, quite quietly, and now you can get any amount. So now people who live in these wealthy co-ops uh, get rid of their maintenance fees, uh, but they, you know, they wipe out mom and pop shops, or we're all paying higher prices to essentially uh, support them. Uh, so that would be another way to go. I'd think about commercial rent control, although now that's anathema to uh, to New York's uh, owning class. You know, these are all programmatic starts. I think also though we have to just start thinking in a different way and thinking about, are we going to preserve any kind of community here? Yeah, I think that's really, that's, that, that's the first step is thinking differently and, and talking differently, right? Because again, back to the memes, they really take over how people think and how we talk to each other. So to start saying, to your friends, to your family, to your coworkers. This is not normal. Let me tell you about what's not normal <laughs> yeah, about yeah. this. This is not natural. It's not the free market. Actually, there are a lot of things that we can do. And one of the things we can do is pass the Small Business Job Survival Act, which I've been pushing with my group Save NYC and other groups have been pushing. Um, basically what that means is that when a lease, a commercial lease is up for renewal, you get to go to arbitration and you get to negotiate a fair lease increase. 
that will protect a lot of small businesses. Um, and 13 members of the city council uh, support it. The council speaker is endorsing it. It's hopefully going to come back to the floor for a vote, and that's what we want to see. So um, people can people can write to the city council and say, we want this. Small Business Job Survival Act. We can have a tax on high rent blight. So high rent blight is all these empty shops like yes. Bleecker Street being wiped out. We can tax those uh, building owners who, by the way, are not mom and pop landlords. These of are not. these yes. are a new class of right, mega right. landlords. Mm-hmm. You know, these are people who have purchased these stores as retail condos for millions and millions of dollars. They're keeping them empty, so we can we can tax yeah. them for keeping it empty. Uh, and absolutely, commercial rent control I think is something that's a much harder fight. But New York City had commercial rent control for almost twenty years exactly. after World War II. It's not a crazy fantasy. It's we've done it before. We can do it again. But we have to go go to a mentality where we actually want to be citizens and we actually want to be in the community with each other. And if if we can shift back to that, and I and I do have hope that people are shifting to that because we have we have come in this country to a place. Uh, I don't want to say a place of no return. We have to return, or we have to push right, through. We have right. to go to a. Yeah. We have to get back to actually being human beings again. I think that's very well put. It's, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, it, cities do change. Mm-hmm. Uh, they always change. And if they don't change, they become Venice, which is a lovely place to visit, but it's essentially preserved in amber. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it, it is a conundrum. How do you change? Um, but right now, the way it works in America is you're either New York or San Francisco or Boston or you're Detroit. And there mm-hmm. has to be some kind of way between that. Otherwise, cities will just become these kind of giant gated communities. Do you feel like part of change could be, because, again, a, a huge a, a huge component of cities used to be middle class yes. people. And if you look at the requirements for affordable housing, it's that seems to be far, far, far below what middle class people actually make or what would be formally considered middle class oh yeah i mean affordable housing you know the way they do it is it it has to do with the median income of i think of the, of the city as a whole i i right, I, right? which is crazy so you've you, you're throwing in all of your oligarchs and, <laughs> and that really so it, it, it should be you know it should be pinned to the neighborhood uh rather than to you know the larger city um uh, you know, when you look at affordable, affordable ha- rents and affordable housing units, they're sometimes six fit. You know, they're, you have to earn six figures mm-hmm. to qualify. That's crazy. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. crazy. So, you know, affordable housing as we have it right now is not affordable. And and like you say in your piece, the city is becoming boring. I think that word is really yes, for the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you define a boring? city? Yeah, I mean, I, well, a city now where the demi monde is kind of. Com- almost completely wiped out uh, a city where there is less and less of cultural interest and less and less that's affordable uh, you know just going to the zoo now going to the Central Park Zoo costs 18 bucks you know? right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a city where uh, so many of the fun things to do are you know simply preserved for the rich if they're there at all mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's an inward looking city you know, and that's the thing, one of the things that struck me about a lot of these new developments, mm-hmm. too. These enormous towers and their advertisements for them are always full about how much stuff you can do without leaving the mm-hmm. tower. Right, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no I- interacting with the city out there. Which is a suburban yeah. model, right? The cul de sac exactly. yeah. houses turned away from the street. Yeah, yeah. very much. Yeah. And, and, you know, the ads are hilarious. You know, one of them advertised, among other things, a faux farmer's market for the kids, oh. you know, which I guess if you want to be a future faux farmer of America, you join that. But, uh, you know, it's, you, you, you think the average New Yorker was a cross between Esther Williams and Minnesota Fats. You know, every, <laughs> everyone advertises a pool and a, uh, and a pool table. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. you, uh, you know, but also restaurants, libraries, screening rooms. Uh, there's no reason to ever leave your safe car elevators place. where you, you can drive yeah. your car right into <laughs> yeah. your condo. Oh my god! Uh, and an that elevator. was that yeah. was one of my favorites. And the, and the ad for that the the person assured you that it would take if a fire started in your car, and therefore in your condo on uh-huh. the fifth floor, say, uh, it would take at least three or four hours before that could break through the oh my god the adjoining wall. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's cool. It's good. It's safe. Yeah. It's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. All we always got to think. And like, don't you want your car just next to the living room? You know. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. Like, right. I, well, yeah. why are people coming to the city if they don't want yeah. to live in a city where you you collide with other people? I don't mean physically mm-hmm. collide. You mm-hmm. collide psychically. You collide emotionally. Exactly. You come into contact with difference. You have to be changed if you're going to live in a city. You have to be willing to be changed by that city. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very you true. cannot come to the city and expect the city to change for you. And that's a really big shift, too. The people are coming and they want the city, they want the neighborhoods they move into to change for them. Yeah. Uh, that's a really different mentality of people who are coming to cities today. And I'm not saying everybody's coming with this intent, but compared to how people like myself and, and maybe you too yeah, came yeah, to definitely. came to the city. I came to the city to be a city person. I wanted right. to be a New Yorker. I wanted to be changed by New York. Uh, but you know, a lot of a lot of the folks now uh, no, they don't they don't want that. Yeah. I mean New York was considered very unsafe when I came in. A lot of that was exaggerated, but it was, you know, it was uh, but I was just delirious about it. And it was a city where you could go and do all kinds of things very cheap. Um, you know, eat food you'd never heard of before, go to see uh, movies in these repertory movie theaters that you hadn't seen before. Mm-hmm. You could sort of get a, a, an amazing education for yourself uh, just by living on a cheap income. I made I, uh, my first job out of college, I made 14000 a year, you know, and I was saving money because I had the three roommates. Uh, I paid 135 bucks in rent. I mean, that kind of experience, I think, or even the proportional part of that experience is just impossible mm-hmm. today. Uh, that's not going to, you know, that's not going to happen again. No. Yeah. And we're going to be stuck with these things. We're going to be stuck with all these horrible buildings and such mm-hmm. yeah. for mm-hmm. centuries. I know. Yeah. Maybe millennia. Yeah. Well, yeah. assuming they yeah. last. Yes. Yeah. Well, these are all very <laughs> badly built. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think uh, what you were just saying about this, um, avoiding collision yeah again it is it is it is something to do with technology again because a smartphone is sort of meant to plug into your brain in a way that's intuitive and it's like well clearly our little monkey brains cannot handle that sort of stimulus all Mm. the time the sort of stimulus you could get out on the street is now just like in your pocket and you're constantly interacting with this stuff swiping doing this doing that you know you don't have to go out to a bar to get laid you find an app and you just lie in bed and you swipe (laughs) you order your food on seamless and it just comes right to you you don't have to get dressed all of these things Mm. it sort of seems like a way to put a stop to how much you have to interact yeah. and you can sort of like regain temporary control. But in reality, it's like all of these things are totally the problem. They are why you feel overwhelmed mm-hmm. email all the time. Mm-hmm. That is why you feel like the death of the 40 hour work week. These are all sort of things that make the appeal of being out in life feel overwhelming and unpleasant. And that's such a right. sad right thing it's so yeah and seamless is a great name for it because what (laughs) what they're selling and what a lot of these people want is a seamless experience of of the world right Mm -hmm. this friction-free experience and so they want to be able to move through the city without being disturbed by the city and Mm -hmm. and and i really see this this sort of co-evolution between the glass these glass empty glass towers and the glass the shiny glossy phone in the hand of course that sort of mimic each other mirror each other and you don't want to be Mm. disturbed by the city you want to be in your in your little bubble I, i was talking to a young woman who was from morocco and she was working at a she was a student and she was working actually in tech but she was also working at a butcher shop that was in the building where she lived and she was telling me that the people at her her tech company where she works um they use these online uh, ordering like seamless Mm -hmm. because they said we're afraid of people we don't want to get on the phone we don't want to see them face to face don't want to have to deal with somebody with an accent right god forbid right they (laughs) actually said we're afraid of people yeah and she was from morocco so she was used to being in the marketplace and and haggling and you know interacting with people so she she for her this was so strange um and it is strange. And again, I go back to that question, why come to the city right. if you're afraid of people right. and you don't want to be around people and you don't want to be disturbed, right? Mm-hmm. I, I want to say, like, I have a, we have a right to be disturbed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You know, right? Yeah. Like art. Art yeah. is supposed to disturb us. And things are supposed and, and that creates an evolution in ourselves. And if we go around never being disturbed, we never grow. Yeah. We never change. 
I think that's very true. And I think like many bad systems, this kind of draws you into it. You know, you might want to go buy something at the local shop, but when it's all closed, you end up ordering stuff online. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you end up, you know, spending more and more time inside because there's nothing out. You know, I remember when the Barnes & Noble put two um, stores on the west side like 30 years ago, 25 years ago, and wiped out every uh, independent bookstore in this big swath of the Mm -hmm. city. And and now they're going down and kind of the things like book culture have kind of sprung up. So maybe there's some hope there. But, you know, you were kind of, okay, well, here's your choice. You can you can buy books at Barnes & Noble. Right, right. Or you can order from Amazon, which is even worse. And it's just sort of like, well, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, and, it, and as you're yeah. saying, it gets harder and harder to resist. Yeah. Right, and I, and I resent that myself. I feel pulled into it. I feel pushed into it. Am I yeah. going to go 10 blocks out of my way to, to go to the drugstore? Am I going to mm-hmm. go to Dwayne Reed? Or am I going to, you know? Yeah. So it becomes more and more of an effort as these places vanish more and more. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can end it there, but thank you both for coming. This was wonderful. Yeah, it was terrific. It was a great chat. The Harper's Podcast is produced and edited by Violet Luca. The music is Cut and Run by Febrifuge, all rights reserved. Harper's Magazine is the oldest general interest monthly in America, exploring the issues that drive our national conversation through long-form narrative journalism and essays. Visit harpers.org to subscribe.